It's Authors Revealed, and I'm Becky Anders, and I'm so thrilled we have actress Kate Mulgrew here. You'll know her from Orange is the New Black, and she was Captain Janeway on Star Trek. But she's here with her new memoir. It's called How to Forget, a beautiful book about love and loss. Welcome to Dave Bill and Andersons. It's so wonderful to have you here. You are delighted to be here, and thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. And this book it is out in the world officially, so your your second memoir in a way, but how to forget a daughter's memoir. Yes. Yeah. So this book, wow, I can't tell you that the writing is absolutely exquisite in this. But it's I think there's so much that any reader can take away from this. And it's 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 about relationships, it's about the way we look at how complex our relationships can be with our parents yes and and what happens throughout our lives but how things can change but also I think there's some great advice for how you handled the situation with your parents at the end of their lives and to share some of that with us so. perhaps to be gleaned from it yeah but I wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't call it advice okay All right. because it, I was living that experience um, so immediately mm -hmm. while I was living mm -hmm. it uh, I was so vigilant about uh, overseeing them in their respective deaths right. that I wasn't aware of um, assimilating any kind of loss yeah. or grief at the time, a aside from a, a, a general malaise and a great sense of anxiety, right. which I think precedes the death of people you really cannot bear to yeah. live without. Yeah. Right. And you know, the, the book, since it's been out, it just was, the launch day was officially Yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. Yes. So yes. it's been, it's just a newborn baby book on shelves everywhere. Uh -huh. So um, what are you hearing from? Because people, of course, have reviewed the book in advance. They and, have. And what are people saying to you? Those who are fans of, you know, Born with Teeth and and your, you know, what your family, your friends, other colleagues. Well, it did just come out last yes, night. Yes, it did just come so out. So my friends have not by okay, right. read it. Yes. Um, right. But my family is mm -hmm. well pleased. Right. Um, I right. won't say I have a detractor in, in one of my brothers, but he's a very private person. Sure. And he's featured in part one of this book, my brother Joe. So yeah. perhaps I scratched that uh, privacy yeah. a little All too right. deeply. And you know, I love my si siblings deeply. So I, I in no way wanted to hurt them. And I, I hope that it, it comes across how right. much I love them. Yeah. Uh, but the reviews have been categorically good. Oh, yeah. yeah. With yeah. every now a yeah. little something yeah. that is disconcerting yeah. to, to read. But. Uh, Good. So, just a question: the, the title, "How to Forget." Yeah, my son gave me. He helped oh, me. Oh, he did. Well, okay. my oldest son, sure. Ian, who's a very smart guy yeah. and very philosophically astute. So, we were talking about what what linked the two stories: mm -hmm. my father and my mother, Alzheimer's, and who my father became towards the end of his life, who was not at all the father I remembered when I was a young girl. So, I said, "It's about forgetting," and he uh -huh. said, "Yes, but it's more about how." you're forgetting how to forget. Yeah. I think that's perfect. Yeah, it is perfect. Especially yeah. coming from him yeah. mattered. Yeah. Well, I think any, with any family or any family relationship with parents, siblings, whatever, you know, there's things that you want to forget, but things are better not forgotten in some ways, too. Well, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in her case, she had yeah. no choice. She had no she? choice, right. When you have Alzheimer's, you forget. That's right. It is the entrance into a darkening thicket yeah. from which yeah. you shall never yeah. emerge. Yeah. Absolutely terrifying. Yeah, it is. It is. So, and the photograph. Tell us a little bit about that. Because my sister I, took that photograph. Do you see her shadow? Yes. Yes. I so, believe so, yeah. that that is the photograph, the shadow of my sister Tessie, who died at fourteen of a brain tumor. So she was probably about twelve at that yeah. time, in the front yard of where I grew up, Derby Grange. Yeah. And they're having a very unusual but not unfamiliar kiss. Yeah. And she's snapping it. Everybody took photos of the family except me. But it's lovely that her shadow falls there. Right. And how uh, interesting that is, yeah. uh, because it did fall between them. Right, that's a won wonderful picture. So um, I can't imagine the fear you must have had, because, and I, and I wonder, what, what, was the, what was the spark or the germ that started to grow 
to sit down and, and write your parents' story and, and to write your relationship as a daughter to them. So what was it that made you sit down? Because it, I think there would, be, there would be anxiety just in writing the story, I would imagine, and yeah. some fear to sit down and write it as well. Well, the subconscious will not be denied. Yeah. I went to Ireland three years ago. I had a house in Ireland. Was it four? I think it was three years ago. And I spent the winters in that house in Ireland. And Irish winters are bitter and very, very lonely. Although I was living in a beautiful house on the shores of Loch Corrib, it was isolated and remote, and I was removed. And it was light for only four hours of the day, and the rain was relentless. So I was filled with a kind of low-grade terror at all times. And just under that was a sadness that was constant, constantly percolating. And I thought I would write a novel, and then I thought, well, maybe I'll write this. And this nagging thing about my father kept returning. And I thought, well, I'll just write a short story about my father. <laughs> Evidently, he won't leave me alone until I do. Mm -hmm. And then it came. Ah, I need to finish something with my father. It's connected to my mother. These two people are the primary sources of everything I know and love about life. They shaped me and they defined me. And there it was. Part yeah. one, dad. Part two, mother. So in part one, you know, you describe that sort of one of the last nights you had with your dad. And tell the us last a little, night I had with my dad. The last night you had with your dad. Tell us a little about that because that, that well, must have been quite a night. But not many people get this. No, right. I mean, first of all, not many people are sitting in the room when the doctor says, you have a few weeks to live. And your father says, not a lot of laughs in your line at work, hey, pal? And he said, kitten, get me my coat. Shook the doctor's hand and he said, I'm sure you're a very fine doctor, but you won't be seeing me again, sir. Got in the car, went home, and I said, how about a drink? He said, now you're talking my lingo, baby. So we had brought out the bottle of Popoff. I lit the fire, and that was the last night we had together, but we had hours, and we consumed the entire bottle of vodka. And we went through God and marriage and lust and betrayal. We went through, I thought, I said to him, you're dying. So now I get to ask you why you've never seen me act. I've been acting for 45 years. At that time, that night, it was 30 years, 35. Mm -hmm. Ah, who wants your your Hollywood nonsense? I never liked it then, I don't like it now. Let's talk about something else, you know? Yeah. And I said, there must be some other reason. Is it mother? Is it mother? Because mother was always coming to see me. Did that really bother you, Dad? Let's talk, let's get Freudian. He said, you want to get Freudian? <laughs> on one of my last nights to live. But he, he got into it with me. And to his credit, we talked about death. And uh, he said, you want to know if I'm afraid of death, don't you? I said, yes, I do. He said, I don't fear it, but I don't welcome it either. And when he said those words, I loved him more, uh, more palpably than I ever had before. Did you learn that night with your dad, did you learn more about your parents' relationship that you, you didn't already know? I knew it, yeah. but I didn't know the size of it mm -hmm. in his heart. Yeah. I didn't know the cost of it to him. I didn't know how severely he had felt the loss of his wife. First after Tessie died, which was the second child to die. So they buried two daughters. But that brain tumor that Tessie had took two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And my mother locked herself in the back room with that little girl. And she said to me, if your father comes back here, I'll kill him. So my father was not allowed to see his own daughter, except by, you know, appointment with my mother. And that fractured the marriage, and then she got Alzheimer's. And I'm the one who forced the diagnosis. I said, I'm taking you to a doctor. We've just been on a cruise. You wet your pants, you left the captain's table, you yawned in his face. Your behavior is beyond eccentric, I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You pushed this, Hollywood. You did it. She would have been fine. Mm. She would have been fine. Right. I don't think so. Yeah. So, you know, when you think of all the, the tears you must have had, I mean, when you read the book, I mean, there are things you can relate to. You, it's not the same experience that anyone has, or you can't replicate that in anybody else's life. But you, you, you get the sense of such sadness, and you cry over these things. Was it hard for you to sit down and write this and relive many of these moments? Of course. Of yeah, I can't imagine. Are you kidding? Yeah, right. I mean, that was the only way to write it, Yeah. was to really 
recall it. And when you go down that rabbit hole, good luck. Yeah. I'm all alone in Ireland in a big house. It's very spooky. Bats are flying through the air. Swans are out in the lake. You know, the fog is going. I mean, the fire is lit, but tears are streaming down my cheeks, and I'm drinking whiskey, and I'm thinking, who, who were you in this? Mm -hmm. Who were you to them? We must get to the bottom of this, and therefore we must start at the beginning. Right. It was very hard, and it's hard now. Doing all of this is hard for me. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, because I'm with them. It's a repossession of them yeah. that I didn't think would happen. Yeah. And it's by no stretch of the imagination cathartic. It is not therapeutic yeah, I can't, because I have yeah. to relive it every time I right. share right. it. What do you think your parents would think of the book? From his point of view. Well, yeah. Oh, he could I can live imagine it. that. Live yeah. it. Yeah. And she'd say, Kitty, do I come off well? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, you know, it's interesting when you think about families and how your siblings react, but it's, and I found this so great, your description in the book, whether it's body language, it's sounds, it's, the visuals were pretty incredible. And your memory, like you said, you weren't the photographer in your family. No. But you had this. I was a different kind of photographer. Yeah, right. Well, it's, and then it makes sense why I became an actress, doesn't right. it? Yeah. And even greater sense why I went back to writing because I was a little writer when I was a kid, ah, okay. at, at the late age yeah. of you know in my late fifties. But it was stamped, of course, on my person, and in my memory, indelibly. Yeah. Those are remarkably vivid things. Yeah. Everything I write about was a particular moment or was a particular right. thing that that mattered around which many things. Mm -hmm. uh, changed and 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 happened so yeah indelibly stamped yeah. but it's so interesting when you think about families each person in a family can take a moment or an event and see it completely different as we all do yeah right i mean all of the siblings that's why it's called memoir and yeah. not autobiography right exactly. i'm not giving a factual yes. account of, right. of what happened here these are my memories and that is my right to mm -hmm. evoke what I recall, it's deeply subjective. And I said to my siblings, I hope you know I'm going to do this. And if you don't agree with the accuracy of the memories, then you must put your own memories on paper. Yeah, right. And maybe we'll just compare it all. But I feel a need and a drive to do it. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. So, you know, when you got that call from your brother that your dad was dying, you were in a one-woman play yeah. in New York. Um, what was that like just to say, I'm done? I mean, Art. Yeah. I say it in the book. I'd never done that before yeah. in my life. Right. Everything in my life had been based on my professionalism. And I have been known for 45 years as a, an absolute reputable pro. Great team player, but mostly top pro. Yeah. I never break the rules. I never let the team down. I never, I've never been late in my life for a call. Yeah. And I'm 64 years old. I've never been late for the theater for a movie, for a series, and I've raised kids, I've done it all. Star Trek Voyager was 18 hours a day for seven years. Never late once, never went in cold, always knew my lines. I mean, my accountability is high. Mm -hmm. um, for me to say to the producers of T at Five, The Life of Catherine Hepburn, I was on a national tour, mm -hmm. I'm going home because I cannot afford to regret this. Yeah. Right. I didn't go home to Tessie's funeral. I didn't go home for Laura's wedding. I am not going to miss my father's death, mm -hmm. and I am going to say goodbye to the man who has allowed me to live. So, in the book, you know, you talk about your dad in the first half. It's sort of sort of split in two: your yeah. dad and then your mom. Well, it is, yeah. And uh, you know, I found that really interesting the way you organize it like that. And then there's those, of course, those pieces that fit together like a puzzle um, with the relationship. But your mom chose you to be her health care guardian. And, um, and so tell us a little about your relationship with your mom, because you, you know, she was an artist, she was a painter, but yet... She had eight children. Eight children, but she according gave, to her, 18 yeah. miscarriages. She was pregnant all the time. Yeah. When my father's car would turn the bend at the bottom of the road, she'd go like lightning up the stairs. Tell your father I'm not feeling well. I'm having a sinking spell. I mean, she just did to avoid having another pregnancy, anything. Yeah. He'd come in. Where's your mother? She's upstairs, Dad. She's having a sinking spell. That look. Because he knew then he couldn't. Yeah. Um, my idealized love yeah. was my mother. But, you know, she asked me to be her mother when I was 14. Yeah at the coffee table in the kitchen. My mother did not have a mother. She, her mother died in childbirth. And she looked at me one day. She said, you know, 
This chasm exists in my person, which is unfillable, a gap I simply will never be able to bridge. Mm -hmm. I have not had a mother. But you, it strikes me, have all the attributes of a good mother. You're strong, you're kind, you're reliable, you're good. Why don't we make a deal? Mm. You can be my mother and nobody needs to know. Yeah. It'll just be between you and me. Yeah. And that pact was signed at that table that day, despite the fact that she laughed, I knew she was serious. Right. And how did and, you feel about that? Well, from that age? moment forward, I was yeah. her mother. Yeah. It just, it absolutely landed in the very bottom of my wow. gut. Yeah. And I said to myself, you better get going. And from that day forward, I moved fast to get out, to study, to find it in the end. I, I mean, I was a professional actress by the time I was 19. Right. Yeah. I couldn't have moved much faster. So you, you, when I think about her, was there a lot of regret for her not being able to fulfill her dreams and because she was so creative in the visual arts oh, and stuff so. like that? Yeah. And having to be burdened by all those yeah. kids. And yeah. she never would say that. Of course, she'd be, you know, right. she, sure. she loved us. But yeah. it was a, a remarkable burden. Mm -hmm. Eight children and then to bury two of them and constantly pulled from the painting which she loved and constantly looking for God. You know, her best friends were Cistercian nuns and monks. It was wild, really wild. Mm -hmm. And she yeah. fell in love with the priest and all that stuff yeah. happened, you know, yeah. crazy time. Yeah. Uh, you know, with your acting career, you know, starting at 19, yeah. how do you think acting has informed you as a writer and what with these two memoirs you've written? The discipline has helped. Okay. I'm a disciplined yeah. person. The acting has really shaped that. Um, and you've got to have that in place if you want to write mm -hmm. as late in the day as I chose to write. I mean, it was the first year of Orange is the New Black in that hiatus that I said to myself, I'm going to yeah. write now. And that's when I went off to, uh, no, I went down to the beach for, for the first time to do that. Um, the discipline and very little else I think that the creative self is a duality. The acting exists in one part and the writing is a different mm -hmm. uh, urge altogether. They don't emanate from the same center. Right, yeah. No. But I, there's a lot of actors, I, I would imagine, and there's some I've seen writ, write books. They can't write like the way you've written, so. I don't think yeah. they need to. Yeah, maybe, that, maybe yeah. It's, there, that's, it, I, I guess that's a, that is. It's a drive. It's a drive, yeah. And yeah. I think perhaps, uh, I have held this in abeyance for years mm -hmm. subconsciously yeah. because I couldn't afford to do it. Right. I had to act. Right. Um, you know, I think how important was you to, to be there at the end? You dropped that play and you Very important head to back to again. Dubuque, Iowa to be to your, where you grew up yeah. to be with your dad. I wanted to be with yeah. my dad. Yeah. And I was with my dad. Yeah. And then the family was all called in and they came. For a week we were together in that house. Yeah. And I did the meals and I went up. But it was I who bathed him. Mm -hmm. And it was I who gave him his morphine. And it was I who sent him off. Yeah. So uh, I wanted that. Never having had any kind of... Uh, our relationship was ill-defined in life. He was tough on me. And I kept saying to myself, all through my life, I know he secretly adores me. I gotta find that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not sure he did at all. Yeah. But I was determined not to uh, squander the opportunity to look him straight in the eye and say, thank you for being my father. Yeah. Yeah. And I know your mom with, with Alzheimer's is so difficult because you lose them at a, a much earlier time. But your mom was, she basically was two years into her into the disease when, when he died. When he died, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine that last moment? My caregiver, yeah. Lucy Ledesma, who had been my nanny, and run my life for years, and helped me raise my children, volunteered to go to Iowa and be my mother's caregiver and mm -hmm. my father's. And so Lucy was in the house with her husband, Felipe, and my mother was listening to, you know, Lucy, who was Mexican. Mm -hmm. And when my mother was led into the death chamber because we couldn't say goodbye and we couldn't put final closure to it until my mother came to say goodbye to her husband. I said, Mommy, this is your husband of 55 years. You must say goodbye. You must say goodbye to him. She looked perplexed. 
She hummed a little, then she stopped humming. She put up her hand to his forehead and went, Adios, El Señor. And that was it. That was it. Wow. How would you like that goodbye after 55 years yeah, of marriage? Right. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's Alzheimer's. It's for Alzheimer's you. for sure, right? Yeah. What did you learn about relationships from your parents? And, and it, especially in writing this, this, this memoir, are there any conclusions you came to re relationships or something to relate to your own children? You know, I mean, that sort of thing. Well, I think I'm, I wrote this in part for my own children, yeah. right. who will not read it uh, anytime soon, but they yeah. will. They mm -hmm. will certainly read it when I'm dead. Yeah. And I will leave it for my grandchildren as well. Relationships are imperative. Absolutely imperative. And, and my mother made that clear. My father was a more isolated character. Mm -hmm. But I think that their love for one another and their, his particular, his passion for her, was a, a fascinating thing to, to witness yeah. and to observe. Uh, relationships to me are crucial. My children notwithstanding, my friendships are imperative to me. My mother had that same gift yeah. for friendship. Yeah. Wonderful friendships in place for 35, 40, 50 years. Jean Kennedy was her friend when she was 10 years old at Sacred Heart, and she was her best friend when she, when oh, she died. Yeah, yeah. You know, remarkable friendships yeah. of endurance. Right. So what was it like going home to Dubuque, having grown up there and going home for your parents? Well, I'd been, I'd been home. A lot of times, You know, I'd yeah. been home. Right. Uh, I'd never really lived in Dubuque. I didn't feel I was a part of it. I left yeah. so early. Yeah, you did. I mean, I, I was 17 when I left, but I feel like I left when I was about 14. Yeah. That's when I started to go off to summer camps and to mm -hmm. school and to Northwestern and to England and to get the training, to get it done. So yeah. I, yeah. I'm fond of where I live. Derby Grange is a beautiful place, yeah. but Dubuque, Iowa was not going to be, hold right. me. Right. <laughs> it was not going to be able to contain me. And I left. I know you did the audio book and I listened to a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, that, that again, had to be hard now to read the, yeah. your words, yeah. um, but you, I can't think of anyone else who could have read it. No, no I think it had to be me. It had I to knew be that you. it had right. to be me. Yeah. And we signed that part of the contract straight up front right. because that was important. Right. I think the audio book to Born With Teeth was a bigger seller than the, um, than the print, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do books anyway, all the time. Yeah. Um, but this was hard. Yeah. I, I demanded perfection, so I went back and back and back. Ordinarily, it'd take me a couple of days to do a book like this. But I just, I said, I don't feel that that is right. Yeah, Let's right. redo the entire chapter. And then I want you to really go through this in post. Mm -hmm. And if there are, I'm coming back for every bauble and every flaw. I went back three times. Sometimes the emotion would catch and I didn't think it was good enough. Sometimes it would get in, in, in the mm -hmm. way of the cadence sure. or the inflection that I was seeking. So yeah. I really took great care right. to deliver this book. Yeah. Well, it can't be any more personal, yeah. No, it can't. Yeah. So, um, I would be remorse with many of your fans out there if I didn't ask a little bit about Red <laughs> and what's in the last season of Orange is the New Black yeah. and, and what other projects you have going on, whether on, you know, theater or on TV or so. And tell us a little bit about Mr. Mercedes as well. I can tell you I'm playing a psychopath on Mr. Mercedes. And having, by the way, the time of my life. <laughs> I can so see yeah, that. I mean, I play Amelaine, and my boyfriend yeah. is 31, and that's just fine with me. <laughs> I mean, he's been my boyfriend since he was 13, and I was 45. She's a cucaracha. Yeah. I kill people and with abandon, and then I sing from cabaret as I'm killing them. What good is sitting and chopping off their fingers alone? I mean, it's wild stuff. <laughs> but it's strangely, absolutely liberated. I bet. On the heels of red. Yeah. And this book and everything else yeah. that attends those things. She's just fun. Good. David Kelly writes like a dream. Jack yeah. Bender's one of the best showrunners I've ever worked right. with. It's great fun. So, you know, I, I remember watching you when I, I don't know if I was in junior high, probably in Ryan's Hope. You were my favorite character on that show. She was good. And I've always noticed with, you know, whether it's Captain Janeway or whoever you're playing, you play fierce women, a lot of the roles that you've done. Passionate women. Passionate women. Yeah. And I think a lot of that stems from where you grew up and, yeah. and who you grew up with. Yeah, and, and the also, you have. also the admonition. I mean, that was my yeah, mother's right. directive. Yeah. Go forth. She said to me, you can either yeah. be a mediocre poet or a great actress. And I think you should choose acting. So let's get going right yeah. now. And now writer is added to that. Well. <laughs> now, if she were here, yeah. she'd say that's great. <laughs> yeah. 
So, Kate, I end these interviews with a quick, this is a lightning round quiz. So this is, you know all the answers. Oh, good idea. Yeah. 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 So okay. whatever comes to mind first will be your answer. Okay. What was your favorite book as a child? Uh, Bronte. Okay. Okay. Oh, how about yes. high school or when you were at NYU? What, what was a favorite book that stayed with you? War and Peace. Okay. All of the Russians, actually. Okay. And have you ever faked reading a book? Faked it? Faked it. Never. Oh, okay. No, that's a lie. Yes, See? I did. Uh -huh. I did when I was 10 years old and I would belo we belonged to a country club and I wanted everybody to think I was a Rhodes Scholar. So I took this tome from my mother's library and I read it by the pool and of course everybody thought I was just a big weirdo. <laughs> I was completely and summarily ignored. Yeah. Okay. Yes, See? I think Okay, it. very I good. It. Okay, what is your favorite play? My favorite all-time play? Yeah, or one you performed in that was your I favorite. Would, well, I loved play Isabella in Measure for Measure, but I did, I played um, Hedda Gobbler. Ah, right. Probably the most challenging role of my I life. Bet. Ibsen, the greatest modern playwright, yeah. Of any book you've ever read, what one would you recommend to anyone you could get your hands on? War and Peace. War and Peace. Yeah. Okay. And or the Brothers Karamazov. But I, the War and Peace comes first because Tolstoy is just divine. Yeah. And do you remember a favorite book that you shared with your sons when they were young? All the children's. And, um, your arms are too big. Or your blah, 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 blah. And um, Good Night Moon. Oh, good, oh, well, yeah. we all loved Good yeah, Night Moon. Yeah. But I'd make up my own stories. Oh, I bet. Good Night Moon. And Good Night Mommy. Mommy's tired and must go to bed. Good Night Mommy. Mommy with the sleepy, lovely head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, shorten that story up a little bit. Yes, right, right. OK, if you could have a dinner with you and three others, they could be writers or playwrights, alive or dead, who would those other three be? Socrates, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Um, and I want somebody else, but she's got to be, maybe somebody like Hannah Arendt. Oh, ooh, I love that, that new graphic mm -hmm. novel. That's fantastic. Ooh. For gravitas. Okay, and I'll be under the table just listening. It's not going to be a lot of laughs. Well, maybe Socrates would be funny. No, I, think, I think he could be pretty funny. Yeah, it could be funny. Yeah, yeah. Lots of uh, okay. wine. Right. And, and anything you're reading now or have read recently that you absolutely love? I'm reading Laurie Moore's recent essays oh, okay. and criticism. She is fantastic. And I'm going to quote her. Uh, and it's a perfect way to end this interview. She wrote something that absolutely struck me through. Somebody asked her what it was like to write memoir, and she said, it's a song of relief alloyed with shame. Ooh, I like that. I understood what she meant. Yeah. It's a kind of secret, but it's a great one. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for writing How We Forget, How to Forget, and thank you so much for sitting down with me. My pleasure. Fantastic interview with actress Kate Mulgrew. You've got to read this book. This book will make you cry, but also make you realize and analyze about the loss and love in your own life. It's absolutely beautiful. It's called How to Forget, A Daughter's Memoir. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed. <laughs>